Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so then it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this week, uh, who's uh, Kwang Sung Jun. Hope I'm pronouncing that all correctly. Uh, so Kwang is a, an assistant professor at uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc with Francesco Rabona at Boston University. And even before that, uh, he spent quite a bit of time at uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, first doing a PhD with Jerry Zhu, and then a postdoc with Rob Novak, Rebecca Willett, and Steve Wright. So Quank has been doing a lot of good work on uh, online learning, online optimization, and more recently getting into bandits. Uh, some of you may remember that he already gave a talk at, uh, at this seminar series. Uh, and he's been really doing amazing work on bandits lately. Uh, that talk was awesome. And this paper is very exciting. I'm really looking forward to this talk. And maybe a little fun fact is that Kwang also served in the Korean military. So you know, be careful about the, you know, what sort of nasty questions you ask him at the end. All right. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kwang. It's a great pleasure to have you here. OK. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. And the first time I actually talked to Gergo was in Europe 2017, where I think it was like two, two posters down. Uh, there was Boltzmann Exploration Done Right paper. I went there and then uh, talked to Yergo. Of course, I knew him before his name, but yeah. So I think uh, it's been like five years, and this talk will be about something close to uh, related to uh, uh, what he has done. Uh, but here's a new algorithm that I found to be very interesting and attractive and I call it malware assembling. Um, and so this uh, is joint work with Jie Bian, who is my student at University of Arizona. Unfortunately, he was not able to get a visa because of the university that he graduated from. And this is some weird rule set up by Donald Trump. Uh, it's called uh, Proclamation uh, 1043. So he just uh, cannot get a visa anymore. So he's been taking uh, PhD program uh, remotely from China, which is very difficult. But uh, he uh, made to uh, make this submission with me, and he, uh, he is, he's uh, you know it's it's not being lifted, so he's gonna move on to other university for a PhD. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that. But uh, this work, I uh, had a lot of help from other people, uh, Junior Honda, Nikos uh, Tor, and Odali Andrew Mallory. So I'd like to thank for them. Uh, but uh, let's get it started. That was a little bit of long introduction, but let me just uh, provide some uh, more high-level point of view of uh, where it is uh, located within uh, machine learning, right? So modern interactive machine learning systems uh, are becoming uh, pretty popular with product recommendations and online advertising and so on, right? So there are items that you want to that system wants to recommend and then the users uh, provide feedback. And based on those feedback, they can retrain their machine learning algorithms to perform better uh, uh, recommendations. But they don't want to just uh, usually stick to whatever looks best for them, because then you're going to be collecting feedback that's only uh, about the items that you know people are interested in, but not the others. So there's a critical component of doing exploration. You know, supervised learning is pretty good at learning from whatever data that was given. But you know the key point in interactive machine learning is how to best collect data, right? This is really data collect decision, which items you're going to, you want to get some feedback on so that you can, in the next round, you, you do better, right? So that's really data collection point of view. And the overall research goal is to uh, develop a small uh, algorithms with small sample complexity, meaning that you want to minimize the number of interaction required with the user in order to learn about their preference and uh, learn a lot and start making interesting recommendations. And also, you want to, uh, you care for the computational comp uh, efficiency so that you can run it on servers. And there are many uh, modern machine learning, uh, interactive machine learning systems like multi-world testing decision service where it has all the components like, you know, back end, there's an online learner and an offline learner. But then in the front end, there's a uh, interaction happening with the uh, uh, users. And uh, based on context, you make some actions and get rewards. Okay, and this is not just for like recommended systems, but you can imagine, you know, doing any testing or even more than two alternatives. So maybe, you know, ABK testing. 
and this all falls into this interactive machine learning. And uh, a popular example is online news recommendation, right? So MSN.com has this uh, website when they when users come, there are slots where they can place interesting news articles. And so you can imagine just for now, there's only one slot and every day a set of K news articles arrive and you observe user context, that's probably about user information, their preferences that's known with, uh, from the previous interactions with the user and you recommend article and you see it's receipts of click feedback and usually you refer to these actions uh, that you're taking as an arm and um, you get this reward and click that's being taken as a reward. And your goal is to maximize cumulative rewards. And if you do it naively with, uh, you know, training classifiers based on the previous feedback and always choose the one that uh, is predicted to be, uh, uh, to have high click through rate, uh, that's uh, probably uh, suboptimal in the long run. So you want to be uh, more uh, smarter in making those selections. Right, so uh, this interactive machine learning is often formulated as multi-banded problem, pretty popular and strong. Uh, the uh, main difference from supervised learning is that you collect non-IID data because it's the algorithm that collects data, not some IID source. And uh, in that case, uh, evaluating an algorithm is non-trivial and costly. You cannot just use existing data that was collected by some other algorithm to evaluate a new algorithm because that evaluation number doesn't mean much because uh, it's evaluated on biased data. And so I think that's why mathematical guarantee is valuable and important for developing decision algorithms. Right. So, and then there are many other novel applications of bandits, including game solving, hyperparameter. There's an algorithm called hyperband that's pretty much the state of the art, uh, one of the state of the art algorithms. And there's some adaptive crowdsourcing trying to uh, find the funniest caption uh, by uh, using smallest uh, number of uh, crowds, uh, crowd workers. Uh, but let me just briefly mention the interesting point from AlphaGo. Um, so AlphaGo uh, mainly advertised with deep neural networks, but behind there was a uh, Monte Carlo research that's doing a heavy lifting there. And actually the paper that, that is uh, from a bandit formulation, but it was applied for trees. And this is our very own Chaba's uh, paper and some uh, another uh, co-author Levin. Right, so it's a bandit based Monte Carlo planning where they propose algorithm UCT, and this UCT algorithm uh, has become really popular in game solving, and it was really groundbreaking in increasing performance of game solving. And one of the extensions called PUCT, that's the one that was used in AlphaGo. And um, but I found this very interesting. This is a bandit for reducing computational complexity. Right, it's not like you're interacting with the environment or interacting with users. But it's just like internally, you are you you have to do a lot of simulations, but you want to minimize the amount of simulations you have to do in order to find the best move. And there are similar work going in this direction where you, they're using banded algorithms to reduce computational complexity in a problem called K needles. K needles is a uh, uh, something like K means, but it, it's central. It has to be chosen as one of the data points, actual data points, rather than some average point. And they have a, a large computational gain from there. Okay, and there are values in studying bandit problems. It's a special case, but it's simpler, and you can develop lots of interesting tools and algorithms and transfer it to reinforcement learning, like one of these examples that happened in the past. And you know, it's generally simple, elegant, novel applications, and so there are many open problems. And, uh, today we'll even talk about uh, the very basic k arm bandit problem and how this uh, new algorithm uh, that I rediscovered, uh, now sampling, uh, is going to be uh, useful. Okay, so I'll spend some time on uh, explaining uh, malware sampling and then uh, talk about why malware sampling, there's some benefits, and then I'll discuss many relationships to existing algorithms. It even has an a close connection to expected improvement, which is a state-of-the-art algorithm from uh, Bayesian optimization. Okay, so, um, and then uh, um, 
if we have some time, we can talk about a little bit more into the analysis, but it, it's a, it, it can become easily boring. So I put it at the last. And depending on how much time we have, we may or may not get to it. But uh, of course, in the afterwards, you know, this uh, off the record discussion, we can uh, still talk about these. Okay, so um, before I start, any uh, questions uh, in the chat? No? Yeah. Okay, so KR Mandy problem. Uh, I assume that you probably know it, but just uh, just let's just uh, define the problem so we can have the discussion, right? So it's an iterated procedure. Is at each time t you choose an arm from uh, K arms, right? And then you receive uh, you pull that arm I t and receive a reward uh, Y t. Okay. So here I'm going to throughout the talk I'll just assume that the rewards are bounded. But in the paper, this is all you know sub Gaussian, so they can be easily generalized. But for simplicity, let's say it's just uh, bound words. and let mu i to be the mean reward of R i, and of course that's an unknown thing, right? That's what we need to learn by observing uh, stochastic rewards, right? So the goal is to minimize uh, regret, uh, and we use the expected pseudo regret. So the first one here is the how much uh, the oracle policy could uh, get, right? The reward of that oracle, because it knows which one is the best one to pull. And you compare that one with uh, uh, your algorithm's expected uh, payoff. And usually you aim for sublinear in T because this is inherently quantity that uh, has the unit T, right? So um, any stupid algorithm still have linear regret. So to have a meaningful learning, you want to have some linear NT, so something like root T or log T. And a way to understand this regret is that you can divide regret by T, which becomes every regret. And you can see that as a convergence rate to the optimal policy or Oracle policy. And there's an exploration exploitation dilemma because uh, you're making decisions based on imperfect information. Um, and a little bit of history, right? Okay. It's a area theory seminar, so I'll skip this, but let me mention that the theoretical interest in machine learning community started from about uh, 2002 with some finite time guarantees made by Peter Auer. And then there has been a, a, a celebrated uh, application by uh, people in Yahoo uh, at that time, right, for personalized news recommendation. Okay, so that's all the setup. And so let's get right into the malware sampling. So I was scrolling through tweets one day, and Dr. Nikos Karampatsiakis shared this news. Hey, folks, have a winner, Stochastic Bandits. There's a hidden gem in Mallard's thesis. It's called EWS. It works incredibly well. And moreover, it gives explicit probabilities on the arm. So I don't expect you to be reading this uh, equations down there it's ugly i'm gonna for formally uh, define it in the next slide but but it's an interesting tweet that shared this uh you know hidden algorithm in a thesis uh and he was tagging galgo and chava uh, as well and i don't know if you guys saw that <laughs> but but uh he shared this uh plot you know it's um it's a little bit worse than thompson sampling but it's about like 20 30 percent worse um but it seems to work well. And um, it has an explicit probability, so there's some benefit about it. So I'll explain that later on. But this is how I discovered this algorithm. And I was thinking that, well, maybe I can use this and uh, turn it into a linear bandit and see how it works. Uh, but then I was reading through, and uh, it was not clear. So that's how I started uh, this project. But let me just first define what is this mal assembly. So I'm, this is. I gave this name malice sampling because you know there's a hidden uh, algorithm in a thesis with the title in French, and somehow I felt the urge to name uh, algorithm uh, with the author name. Okay, so it was uh, in 2013, but let me mention that the credit should also go to Honda and Takemura from earlier papers, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll talk about that later on. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm. It's a randomized algorithm. At time t, you do the following. You sample arm i with probability pi that's proportional to this exponentiated quantity. 
And in the exponent, you have minus two times ni, the number of arm pole uh, for arm i. And this delta i hat is the empirical gap. It's the gap between the best empirical mean reward and the empirical reward of arm i. Okay, and the mu i hat, that's uh, very naturally, that's the empirical mean, of course, it's computed based on ni sample that you have collected so far. Okay, this is pretty simple. It's uh, maybe even like, it, it's described with, with it like less than like 10 characters in the, this probability formulation. And um, so what this uh, thesis uh, reported is that it has a, okay, instance dependent regret. So instance dependent regret uh, you have this first term, which is uh, involving delta i inverse, right? If you know about this bandit guarantees, right? This delta i is true gap. That's the true counterpart of the empirical gap, okay? And the first thing here is the optimal quantity, right? So I'm showing the optimal in below. And compared to that, you have this weird extra term, which is delta i to the minus three power times k. And what that translates into the worst case regret or minimax regret, or sometimes people say gap free bound, because this is a worst case regret where you take the worst case of the gap while fixing K and T as a fixed quantity, right? And uh, the, the consequence is that the minimax regret become T to the three fourths. And that's far from the optimal rate. Okay, so at this point, it's not clear if this is a good algorithm. But uh, my uh, student, Jie and I are working on this uh, proof. And we actually show that this algorithm, without changing anything, is already near optimal. And it has lots of good attractive properties. And so it, it doesn't have like this blue part that I'm showing there. That's just an uh, artifact of the analysis. And actually, I was not able to follow some part of the proof. And I uh, sent an email to. Uh, uh, Odalic, uh, Embry Mallard, and he told me that he agrees that it is not clear, but it, it might be true, right? I, I just uh, didn't find a way to uh, understand. So that's Mallard sampling. Um, and the title says Baltimore exploration done optimally. So, you know, how is this related to Baltimore exploration? So what is Baltimore exploration? It's a popular heuristic in reinforcement learning where at time P, you choose action I with probability proportional to X of some step size times empirical mean of arm I. So the intention is clear. Whenever an arm has a good, uh, it shows a uh, high empirical mean, then you try to spend more time with it. So you uh, increase the sampling probability for that, right? So it's pretty intuitive and natural thing to do. But how does it work in bandit setup, right? So people are using reinforcement learning, but if it has to be a good algorithm, then it has to be good in bandit setup as well. So this is what uh, uh, Galgo and other uh, people have shown uh, in this, uh, you know, I'm showing the full author list on the right hand side, right? Um, it has a linear regret in the worst case. And um, in this paper, uh, they show a, uh, a fix. Okay, they took some follow the perturbed leader point of view with the uh, dumbbell thread. Um, but the even fixed version has a suboptimal regret, which is log square t. Okay, which is not bad, but it's not great. Okay. But you can actually relate Boltzmann exploration with Mallard sampling. So first step is to rewrite uh, Boltzmann exploration by multiplying some constant. The constant that I'm multiplying here is x minus eta t times the largest empirical mean. Like the largest empirical mean is not a function of mu, uh, the, like it's, it doesn't change with, with the index i, right? So this is a constant you multiply. But this is a key step. You take square of the difference. Okay, this, that's an always non-negative quantity, right? You're, you know, the difference between the largest empirical mean and the empirical mean of our mind. It's non-negative quantity. You just take square. And you specify the step size as uh, two times nti. 
Well, this is malassembling. The thing that you have in the inner parenthesis, that's the empirical gap. Okay, so you can view uh, malassembling as a, a corrected version of Boltzmann exploration, where you just uh, you know multiply some constant to that probability and you know, just square that quantity, right? And this is still something that makes sense, right? This empirical gap, it has certain estimation error, so you don't want to fully trust it, but you trust it to a certain degree. But what degree? You, 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 your degree of trust is a uh, number of armfuls. If you have pulled that arm I a lot, then you trust this uh, empirical gap more. Right? So as you trust more, meaning that you have a larger and larger n, your sampling probability goes down and down and down and down. Okay, so and there are other relationship with uh, uh, from meta sampling to Thompson sampling and expected improvement, but I, I wanted to deliver the main selling points of meta sampling first and then get to the relationship. So, well, uh, uh, quick question here. Um, is there some assumption hidden here about the range of the rewards? Um, hidden assumptions about on when, when we talk about Boltzmann exploration or so the mylar sampling when, when you start to square things, uh, if the yeah. range was you know like uh, not normalized or something, then you're increasing differences. And if you normalize that everything is below zero and one, oh, then right. you're decreasing things and like, exactly. oh, what's going on, right? So, here you see the constant factor two. That's actually one over two times sigma squared, where sigma squared is the sub Gaussian parameter. But sigma squared is one fourth because we're considering bounded reward between zero and one. So I'm omitting that detail, right? So good observation. Okay, um, any other question at this point? No? Okay. Okay, so that's the Mallard sampling, how, how it's related to Boltzmann exploration. Okay, so why Mallard sampling? There are popular banded algorithms like Thompson sampling and UCD. And I claim that Mallard sampling can be, can ease, no, that doesn't make sense, can be a serious contender to uh, Thompson sampling and UCD. Okay, so let me summarize that as the three uh, main selling points. The first one is friendly to offline evaluation. Second, it's tunable for better performance without breaking theoretical guarantees. And three, uh, it has a simpler and tighter analysis than Thompson sampling. Okay, that's meaningful given that people write papers just about analysis of Thompson sampling. And you know, recently there has been some, um, you know, uh, up until recently, like people didn't, was not able to figure out whether the linear Thompson sampling's regret bound is tight or not, right? So, you know, if there's a value in, uh, uh, doing similar things, uh, but uh, have a simple and tighter analysis. But before we proceed, just to be on the same page, let me just briefly introduce upper confidence bound algorithm, right? So what you do in UCB is that you maintain confidence bound. So on the picture on the right hand side, you're seeing a, uh, you know, dots are the empirical mean and this parentheses are confidence bounds, right? And you uh, choose the arm that has the highest confidence bound Okay. And usually that formula has this um, nice decomposition of exploration, exploitation term and the exploration term, right? And this is a celebrated optimism in the face of uncertainty principle because you're like using the highest statistically possible mean reward as an index to choose an arm. It's a very simple sort of greedy criterion that you can follow uh, to solve this problem. And something similar but different is Thompson sampling, where it starts from choosing a prior over the unknown mean rewards. And each time P, right, you maintain a posterior distribution based on the samples you have collected so far. So for example, on the right hand side, you're seeing the, these three different posterior distributions, but now you sample a value from there. So this is not sampling from the environment. This is internal sampling. You have internal simulation where you just sample from the posterior. And you take that values and find the one that has the largest value. So, you know, this is not randomized algorithms because uh, this is a decision based on the samples. 
Okay. Um, so from the picture on the right hand side, let me mention that first, right? So um, ARM2 has a large uh, posterior variance. So it has large probability of being sample because it has a much thicker tail upward. Right? It's uh, likely to have a, a more likely to uh, be become the best in, uh, the best when, when uh, in terms of the samples. Right, so and let me mention that there's a benefit of randomization. It copes better with delayed words. It was reported by the Lee and Chapelle from uh, 2010, right? And uh, it's just that you're doing randomization. You're, so you're not like fully committed with the current information, but there's some sort of a, a, a hatching going on. So it, it's often better uh, better for the delayed words, but delayed words happen all, all the time in industry. And some bit of history, right? So there was a report that says it works well, but no guarantees. But if you look back in like books and papers in eighties, there are also mentions about, you know, it seems to work well, interesting, but there's no guarantee. But uh, guarantees were provided by Agrawal and Goel, and then Kofam and Korda and Munoz have their own version of the analysis. Okay, so that's just the, you know, background. So coming back to the selling point, so I, I needed to introduce the Thompson sampling to talk about this offline evaluation. So what is offline evaluation? Well, suppose the following scenario. Yesterday, you ran a banded algorithm A. You recommended news articles. You have obtained a set of pairs, articles, and clicks. Right? This is the data. Now to test a new algorithm B, you must run it with real users. Right. Again, it is, you know, you, you, you're going to collect a set of, you know, data points that are not IID. So you can evaluate, but that evaluation number doesn't mean much unless you do something special. Right? Okay. So you have to run it with real users. You have to sacrifice the traffic. So there's a cost. Or can we perform a counterfactual evaluation where we can try to answer how many clicks would we have received yesterday? Had we, had we run B, right? This is, would be a very attractive because if you could do it, then you don't have to actually test your new algorithm with real users. You can just do this counterfactual evaluation, right? This is a really useful stuff. And when I talked to some folks in Amazon, they said they're doing it uh, uh, all the time these days. I don't know about today, but it was uh, about three years ago. So, okay. So it turns out it's possible, and actually, if you look into uh, statistic literature with missing data, I mean, this is uh, everywhere, inverse propensity scoring. Okay, so what you do is that you can construct reward estimators for time step T and arm I. Okay, so I'm going to call it R prime. That's the reward that is estimated to be this uh, RT over the probability of sampling times this indicator. And here, the important part is this PTI of A, right? This is the probability of pulling arm I, that probability assigned by the algorithm A. So if you do this, then you can run algorithm B with this R prime, and the rewards are unbiased, okay? Although it comes with large variance, and there are lots of other issues, but, you know, it's uh, an active area of research. But, but still, it's an interesting thing to do. And people try to always keep track of this, uh, um, this kind of uh, estimator. OK, but it has a requirement. First of all, the algorithm A that you use for collecting uh, data must be a randomized algorithm, right? So for example, you cannot use UCD. UCD is a deterministic decision algorithm, OK? And furthermore, you need to compute the value of PTIA. That's the probability of pulling arm A by algorithm A at time T, right? So when you run Thompson sampling, you can run it, but measuring what was the probability of that decision, right? That is not trivial, actually. There's no known closed form solution, as far as I know. You can use Monte Carlo simulation, right? From the same situation, you can try to get posterior samples a lot and uh, just count the fraction of times each arm is pulled. Uh, but those modern interactive machine learning systems get millions of clicks every day. Like Google AdWords receives about 
237 million clicks per day. Okay. That's a lot to compute, uh, and it's certainly an overhead for the system. But now the sampling does. It just computes unnormalized probability, and you normalize, and you get the probability. Okay. So that's one attractiveness. Is there any uh, question so, uh, so far? OK. Um, OK, so next selling point is tunable for better performance. So here's an observation. Uh, this is what many people have done in the past. Bandit algorithms are often too conservative. So meaning that it's uh, doing too much exploration. So it spends more time exploration than necessary, and it incurs large regret than, than some of the more naive algorithms often. So, so you know, you spend a lot of time proving theorems about UCD and you run it and it doesn't work. So what do you do? You do some heuristic width tuning. That's what I call. What, what so this width tuning is where you just arbitrarily just sort of uh, reduce the amount of exploration, right? So in UCD, right, you have this uh, exploitation term and exploitation term, which is uh, basically continent width. And people often just multiply some constant C that's less than one. And empirically, that's going to reduce the uh, regret. Okay. For toxin sampling, you can do the same by adjusting posterior variance. Now, the bad news is that this breaks the theoretical guarantee, and you can actually prove, uh, uh, prove uh, suboptimality in the, in the long run. Okay. I don't have a proof, but I'm pretty sure you can prove. Okay. But, you know, but here comes a natural question. It, like, is this really the best thing we can do? Like, could we remove excessive exploration without breaking guarantees and still remain optimal? Okay, so here's the solution. So the malice sampling as is, one thing to note is that for the empirical best arm, you always get unnormalized probability as one, right? Because this delta i had become zero, for the empirical best form, right? So it's x of zero, so that's one, okay? But why does it have to be one? We could do something else. So the malassembling plus uh, takes the following form. So for the empirical best arms, it'll assign uh, the unnormalized probability of B, which is uh, at least one. So if, if B is one, this is the same as MS, but if B is larger than one, it'll favor exploitation. It'll assign higher probabilities to the empirical best arms. Okay. And by the way, this is a simplified form. The actual malice sampling plus has another uh, uh, sort of a modification in the exponent just to get the minimax regret a little better. But this is uh, simplified for the purpose of the talk. Okay. So. You can actually analyze this, and you'll see the following guarantee. Okay, so here's this extra term. The first term is uh, the whatever you see in the optimal thing. The second one, it's uh, increasing with B. Okay, if B is larger, then it becomes larger. But notice that it doesn't include T. So, for large enough T, the first one will be dominating. Okay, so tuning B is only the behavior at the initial period. Okay. So we don't lose guarantee. It's still there, but we can accelerate it. Now, let's see how it works. So this one is just trying to see the effect of the changing B. So this is an instance with 10 arms, Gaussian noise. I'm running it for 20,000 iterations. I ran malassembling plus 200 times for every B value in the range of 1 to 128. Okay, 128 is quite a bit of a extreme number. But as you see, so this is the regret plot versus the log, uh, log 2 of B, right? And the error bars are standard deviation. As you can see, there's a, some trade off between the average regret. Uh, versus the variance, okay? The variance increases, of course, with larger and larger um, uh, value of D, okay? But even with like 128, the 
average regret is uh, around uh, around 400, which is uh, similar to the case of uh, B equals to uh, one. And another observation is that up to this B equals to four, which is um, uh, this two in this axis, X axis, right? The variance doesn't increase much. It just reduces uh, the regret, okay? Um, but then, you know, after that point, now the average regret reduces and the but variance uh, increases. And so, you know, this is um, just, a, you know, showing that, well, you can tune, but it's, um, it's still doing uh, okay. I mean, increased variance for large enough. So you want to avoid that. But depending on your application, you might be able to find some better tuning B uh, that'll give you uh, uh, less regret. Okay, but you know, how do we know this is like sublinear one? So I plotted this. So this is just the same experiment. I'm plotting the regret versus time for each B. And you can see that even for 128, yes, variance is large, but it's still sublinear curve as you can see. On the other hand, if you use UCB, right, this is a case where you have no guarantee, right? So here I'm tuning, I'm multiplying one over B in front of the confidence width, okay? So that larger B, B means uh, more exploitation. But if you do that, you know, after a certain point, you start having linear regret. It's very clear from the curve. And if I show you the regret at time uh, 1000, it seems like the malice sampling would have chosen uh, B equals to uh, 64, but UCB looks better. It's like 72. But even if you had that choice, right, if you run it long enough, it just becomes linear, right? So that's the qualitative difference in tuning this confidence width versus this uh, B parameter. I, I call it boosting parameter, booster parameter, right? So there is a qualitative difference. Okay, uh, next on point is uh, the fact that it is uh, just the analysis uh, simpler and tighter. Okay. So if I look at Thompson sampling proof, it's about 10 pages total, single column. Mal sampling is four pages if I use single column, and I'm being generous here actually. And the, our paper even had the main analysis in the main paper, the main part of the paper, not in the uh, supplementary material. There's only like small part where it gets boring that I move to uh, 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 supplementary material, but really the main part is still there. And if you look at the analysis of Thompson sampling, so this is uh, the analysis for the sub Gaussian case, but uh, you know, it, it, it has like this crazy constant like e to the 64 and some constant like 288. For our analysis, the largest constant we can see is like four. Of course, we're using order notation, but that's because uh, it, it has a complicated form. I just wanted to reduce, not that the constant is large. Leading constant is like, you know, at most like four. So it's just uh, uh, evidence of like, you know, analysis is generically, generally uh, simpler and uh, tighter. And so I, I could go into some of the uh, uh, analysis details, but I found that that uh, easily become uh, boring. So We'll, we'll take it uh, after uh, uh, other interesting points are delivered. And uh, let me be honest, right? The proof techniques, uh, it's uh, inspired by existing work, you know, Mallard uh, thesis, although there's some part that I was not, not able to follow, uh, some techniques uh, can be used. And uh, I also got a lot of help reading into the uh, analysis of Thompson sampling. So in terms of optimality, our best bound, right? This is, the, if you look at the last line, Mallard sampling plus, right? That's the best one we have. And um, that one achieves this criteria called sub UCB. And sub UCB is a property uh, that says uh, the finite time uh, regret bound has to be uh, within a constant factor of the UCB. And there's one algorithm that doesn't achieve that, which is minimax optimal uh, uh, algorithm. Um, so we, we don't get the minimax ratio of one, but 
other all properties like asymptotic optimality being any time and having postponed probability, right? It, we all satisfy those uh, conditions. And for Gaussian noise, right? We were talking about sub Gaussian noise, but if you go to Gaussian noise, uh, there's this uh, monstrous paper by Tor Latimore, uh, which is at a UCD, and it achieves uh, sub UCD and asymptotic optimality and minimax ratio. It achieves all the optimality criteria that's known to date. Um, of course, you can extend it to sub Gaussian, and it's not any time, but you, you know you can turn it into an any time algorithm. Um, but so I guess open problem, one of the open problems is to uh, modify malice sampling in a similar way that was done in at UCD, so it achieves all the known optimalities. But except for minimax ratio, we're pretty much good. Okay. But, but to make that minimax ratio without losing sub UCD, that turns out to be very difficult. And this at UCD is the solution Tor has uh, come up with, uh, but good luck with reading the paper, it's uh, quite technical. So, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a very good paper. Uh, I, I spent time uh, to read that paper. But, okay, um, but any question so far? No. I do have a bunch of questions, but I think it, it will be better to ask them at the end. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, so some high level comments. Thompson sampling seems to have become the holy grail, right? It's the industry standard and everyone, you know, likes that idea. Of course, there's a really upside. There's really good thing about Thompson sampling. First of all, algorithm design is straightforward, right? As a Bayesian design, right, you specify what the reward distribution should look like. And you know, you specify prior, then you're done. You just uh, sample from posterior, and you know, it's a pretty much a happy story. And also for structured bandits, like linear bandits or, you know, other structures, computational complexity with respect to the number of arms is low, right? What, what I mean is that you eventually end up sampling a model from posterior. Now you just trust into that model and, you know, what if this model say about the mean reward of uh, each arm. And that often becomes a very easy computational problem compared to like, say, you have a confidence bound, confidence set for that you know, model space and you, know, you try to compute the largest uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, true mean, right? The confidence bound for each arm, it often becomes a more harder uh, optimization problem. But then there are downside about Thompson sampling. The analysis is hard. Like people write papers, like just even like a couple of months ago, I was reading paper that, you know, here's an improved analysis of Thompson sampling for this specific model for this specific arm set, right? And then, um, you know, another example of analysis being hard is, you know, tight analysis of linear Thompson sampling was open problem for a while. I think that was resolved by, uh, uh, Mosen from uh, Sanford Group uh, and his co-authors, uh, but it just showed that analysis is uh, just not easy. And also, like the critical question is, can you sample from the posterior? Right for the nice cases with you know conjugate priors and so on, yes you can, but for complex models, often you cannot. So you have to resort to MCMC sampling, but MCMC sampling is never scalable. Right, so, um, and, and so you often also apply approximations and give up on the regret analysis because uh, analysis becomes pretty hard. Okay, but malice sampling, well, it has a benefit of, you know, having close one probability and that actually frees up a lot of uh, uh, issues around the analysis and so on. Right, you just, uh, it's, it's, you, and you have a better control. And one example is our sally point number two that the you can change the algorithm so it's easily tunable, right? It's an evidence of being flexible by the fact that uh, you know the have the close form probability. And for complex model, I we believe really value sampling should be easier to analyze than complex sampling, but we have to do the work, um, right, to show it because uh, we only have this uh, basic KR bandit version, and still need some work to make the algorithm design as easy as complex sampling, right? 
algorithm design, it's a uh, time sampling has a clear benefit. Some ongoing work, uh, I'm very blessed with, uh, to have uh, Chi Cheng Zhang, who also worked on, partly worked on banded problems. Uh, so uh, we, we are joint advising uh, two students, Jie Bian, working on linear version, Hao Chin, on statistics uh, for exponential family version, so we can directly handle the newly rewards. And then there's an interesting relationship to IMED. It's by Honda and Takemura. Okay, so I'm not going to explain every single thing, but what it does is it's a deterministic algorithm. And its criteria is like R min of number of arm poles times some, di some notion of divergence plus logarithmic term. Now, if you take, expo if you expo exponentiate it and then take one of, take the inverse, it becomes the following form. And you can maybe realize the similarity, right? The mal sampling would be X minus number of arm poles times the gap square. But in fact, for Gaussian, um, this is known to be like the gap square. Okay, so you, you see the clear connection there uh, with the IMED. And I was excited. What about we do the following? So, so okay, so the main point of the IMED is that it's a generic strategy that works for any reward distribution. Okay, so it's uh, defining everything in terms of tail divergence. So what, what if we extend mal sampling by taking that exponent and now we just do it randomized, okay? So I was calling it like the following. I emailed Junior Honda and like title a possibly randomized version of IMED. Okay, and then he replied to me, well, I did this even before IMED, it's called MED. It was from 2011, but it's a journal paper. So it's like, I'm guessing that he was working on the submission from like 2009, okay? And he said like, you know, the analysis was a bit unpolished. If you look at the paper, there are lots of assumptions. I have the full title at the bottom um, and it works for finite support models only. And there's quite a bit of uh, assumptions and uh, asymptotic analysis and so on. But he made this interesting comment. At that time when he was working on this MED, this pre thompson sampling era, where randomized algorithms were not pre preferred by reviewers, right? Why would, you ran why would you inject noise rather, right? Why are you like increasing variance for your algorithm? I don't get it, right? So that motivated him to develop like de-randomized version of MED and that became DMED and then followed by IMED. Okay, so I'm going backwards, right? I, I took from IMED and then like, oh, actually, you know, it seems uh, let's randomize it. But he was, you know, developing randomized version and then taking it to uh, deterministic versions. Okay, and by the way, Malice thesis doesn't uh, cite DMED, but not MED. So I'm not sure if he was aware of it. And so probably, uh, he, 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 you know, it, it was an independent uh, development of the algorithm from him. Um, okay, so um, I saw the chat message. Uh, is there a question? Oh, somebody was already anticipating expected improvement, but apparently. Oh, okay, okay, just cool. All right, so relationship to expected improvement. Well, you know, it's a state of the art in Bayesian optimization, and you can. It's a generic principle rather than a specific uh, algorithm, right? So generic principle, you can write down the objective, and you can work out what it looks like for each uh, specific problem. Okay, and it's the one that ha analysis recently, just recently, became available. And for the K-arm bandits, it looks as follows, okay? You're choosing arg max of these two terms where the first one is appearing with Gaussian CDF, the second one appears with Gaussian PDF. Okay, so let's look at the second one first. The second one, you have this, uh, okay, so uh, I think there was some uh, typo. I, I think, um, okay, but well, let me ignore that. The important thing is this X part. You have this x, okay, and then there's uh, x minus uh, arm pole times gap squared. Well, that looks very much like the IMED. The first one is Gaussian CDF, okay. So uh, in, in this, you can use the uh, 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 bound on Gaussian CDF to uh, bound it 
with the form that's shown below, okay? But then there's delta i hat in front, but with this approximation, this, this thing cancels out. So you're left with uh, this form. Okay, so this form, right, this is uh, very much similar to IMED, right? It has one over ni, but it's like one over uh, square root of ni, right? So there's a clear connection there, right? It's a uh, IMED, it's a, uh, you know, de-randomized version of IMED, and um, um, this one is, uh, turns out to coincide with expected improvement. Okay, so that's interesting. And actually, you can also find relationship to constant sampling. So consider just uh, two arms, okay? And you have this posterior. The first two lines are the posterior. The posterior of uh, at the uh, mu, mu one hat, and then another posterior, mu two hat, and their variance is uh, proportional to uh, the one over the sample count. Uh, you suppose you draw a sample from that posterior x1 and x2, and the probability that arm two being sampled is probability that x2 is larger than x1. So let's call that x2 minus x1 to be z, and then z if you work out those uh, you know normal distribution algebra whatever right then you get the z follows this normal distribution with a particular mean and variance, and this variance that I'm denoting by omega square. Eventually, if you do the right thing, right, the, 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 eventually the best arm, eventually the best arm will be uh, pulled a lot. And so one over T1 gets very small, so it essentially becomes one over T2, okay? But because this is now Gaussian, right, you can just uh, work out the tail probability. And it, it eventually, skipping details, if you just look at the bottom, it takes the form X minus delta hat squared over W uh, omega omega squared. And omega squared one over T2. So it, it's essentially X minus T2 times the gap squared, right? So that's uh, basically Mahler sampling. But now what about more than two arms? Well, it's, uh, it doesn't, I don't know how to express that. So, but, but you know, you can sort of uh, see the connection there and maybe you can consider motivating Mahler sampling from just taking pairwise, the empirical best and the second empirical best, compute this probability, and it's approximated to be this x minus something. And you do that for the best and the second, uh, the third best arm, all these pairwise, and then you try to uh, average that uh, out, uh, or you, you try to normalize those values to uh, come up with the probability distribution over the arms and sample from it. Okay. So there, there's a clear connection. And so it's, uh, to me, it's like, well, it's up for something. Like, it's not just uh, some random choice that this malice sampling is making. There's gotta be something deeper going on with all these uh, close connections. Okay, so I think uh, time's almost running out. So some open problems, naturally, you know, consider whatever things you've been solving for UCB Thompson sampling, you can also try to do it with malice sampling. But of course, the bigger picture that we all want is uh, can we develop plug and play algorithm where given a model class, it will just achieve the optimal regret. Okay, and some effort was shown and some effort are as promising, right? This paper by uh, Dallin Foster, uh, Kakade, Chen, uh, uh, Rocklin, uh, you know, I think it was uh, a few, only a few weeks ago in RL theory seminar, right? right? So they proposed this decision estimation coefficient Right, that should be the dominating thing. That should be the right quantity for the uh, um, minimix uh, optimal uh, regret. Okay, so actually at that seminar, I raised, uh, I mentioned about malice sampling, and he said something like, you know, why don't you try to find a connection to malice sampling uh, and uh, uh, this DEC co uh, DEC quantity. Right. So I don't know if he's listening, but um, uh, I plan to look at it after two rips. Uh, right. So. Yeah, it would be interesting to find either some some variant of MS can achieve uh, this uh, uh, regret bound based on the DEC quantity. And of, also it would be great to find some uh, version where we can achieve both instance optimality and minimum optimality. 
And I wonder if we can make connections to information-directed sampling. And information-directed sampling, at least this numerator has this in, the, the empirical gap squared. So I find, find that, you know, that might be, uh, there might be some relationship. Okay, so the rest is uh, pretty much uh, proof. Probably cannot get to it, but the slides is available, so you can take a look at some high-level ideas. Um, okay, and um, but but let me mention one, one conjecture. Okay, so we have this malassembly and malassembly plus. Malassembly plus um, achieves a little bit better minimus uh, bound that has factor of root log k instead of root log t. But after submission, I, I really believe that vanilla malassembling should already achieve uh, root kt log k minimax rate, not, uh, not the log, k, log t in it. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's my conjecture about that. Um, but stay tuned. Uh, we have some follow-up work where we uh, might be able to address that. Um, and let me just uh, you know, finish the talk by uh, acknowledging the funding support from the organizations at uh, UA and uh, many people who helped out shaping the project. All right, thank you very much, Kwang. Wonderful. So I'm afraid uh, we are not going to let you go without uh, without talking about the proof, uh, but maybe we can sure. address some of the easier questions uh, before that, yeah. in case uh, anybody has any good questions. So, so Chow had a good question. Uh, uh, actually, like a couple of questions. So Chow, could you unmute yourself and ask? Oh, uh, yeah. I, yeah, hi, Professor Trin. Nice, nice talk. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, have, I, I have a quick question, uh, which is like a comparison between Tom sampling and uh, Mala sampling. Yeah, to yeah. me, like uh, MS is approximation of Tom sampling. However, it does not take the, in some sense, the correlation between like other sub suboptimal arms into account in some sense. When you calculate, for example, let's say arm tree is sub sub suboptimal arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm, so basically I'm asking like, is there any like numerical evidence showing that when the number of arms is large, like MS has like almost the same like uh, performance as Tom sampling? Let's say for the slip package case, one arm is, is the best and the other arms are sub yeah, 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 yeah. But they are the I same. I see where you're with that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, but, but here's something I can say, right? Up to logarithmic factors, Mala sampling and Thompson sampling has the same regret bound. So they must be assigning similar probabilities. If they assign widely different sampling probabilities, uh, I think it should be, uh, um, they should have a different order of regret. That's what I think. Uh, but, but like we, we kill the exact regret, not the regret bound. Yeah, but order wise, right? Order wise is similar. Yeah, yes. I mean, if we just compare the regret upper bounds, then they are almost the same. But I'm asking when, when T is small, let's, when, when T is small, the time horizon is small. And the exact regret between these two algorithm, let's say k is like 100 and t is like 500. Yeah, I see. I and see. So you want one, one more precise behavior with a small t, where uh, probably many things are not quite well captured. Uh, yeah, yes. I, right. OK, so well, one thing I can mention is that this Thompson sampling it, it's inherently designed for the Gaussian reward. And that's why they have this, if you look at, in front of this X, you have this extra stuff, right? Extra stuff that can only be there and have analysis. Uh, uh, and that's only, that, that, that can be only analyzed under Gaussian uh, distribution, I think. So there's a little bit of difference there, but I guess your point was uh, more on, you know, what if, you know, there are other suboptimal arm comes in. So I, I, my guess is, okay, I don't have a very strong sort of uh, numerical evidence, but I mean, they can be quite a little different, uh, but I guess what I'm saying is they cannot be dramatically different. 
they have the same uh, order of regret and also you know they're near optimal uh, so you know that difference cannot be uh, too large uh, the reason why i mentioned this is because like for the simple regret setting uh, what i observe is that top two term sampling is like uh, performs in some sense much better than the top two expected improvement and uh, that's something I want to mention. The reason is that the correlation I mentioned at, at, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, also, right, right, right. also, the last thing I want to mention is that I personally, I don't, in some sense, I don't agree that the analysis is hard, is a drawback of an algorithm. That, that's just my thinking. Yeah. No, 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 no offense at all. OK. Yeah, I mean, my point of view is like, you know, we have limited amount of good researchers and good researchers are spending time on just proving stuff about some algorithm that, you know, I mean, Thomas Henry is a good algorithm, but it's not the silver bullet, right? So, yeah, I guess that's the, uh, that, that's the point of view I was having. Yeah, I agree, thanks. Um, but, but yeah, I, I see, I see where you're going with it, right? So. Numerically, Thompson sampling really works well. I, I, I can tell you that. Um, but it's not the like, best working. Like If you run for Gaussian rewards, if you compare Thompson sampling versus at IUCD developed by Tor Latimer, Tor Latimer's algorithm works very well. It, it, it's better than Thompson sampling. Yes, yeah, thank you. But, but yeah, as it is, as is uh, you know, in the default form, Tom sampling and now sampling, Tom sampling seems to work better. Uh, but you can use this uh, tuning trick and then they become comparable. But I just still see like Tom sampling is a little bit better. That was my experience. By the way, on this analysis of Tom's sampling is difficult. Well, I don't know, like uh, people, kept rewriting it and so for example in our book we have a two-page analysis with okay additional exercises but those are the boring stuff and the additional exercises we wrote up the solutions to those and i looked it up and it's like very very generously spaced like lots of white space the solution to those exercises is four pages long so now we are at six pages <laughs> but with very very generous spacing uh so i think yeah, you can improve these analyses too, but uh, like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I take your viewpoint too that like, yeah. Yeah, it's, but, but it's, I mean, like, so if, you, if you go to like much uh, harder setup, like more complex model, even like linear version, like, people even had struggle to see, you know, tightness of the, the, the existing upper bound, upper bound of linear compton sampling. I mean, that was a, uh, yeah, that's a different question, I think. That was not, not just a question of whether we have the right analysis, the right proof technique. It was a real mystery in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, algorithm is fixed, but the analysis is hard. And I think part of the reason is that we don't have a precise sampling probability. Like it, it's um, or, or yeah. I mean, like no close form. Right, that was the difficulty. You know, Mark Ardell and um, Alessandro Lazaritz had this uh, linear compton sampling revisited, and then when I talked to him, like he was unsure if the, the still the analysis is tight or not, and he suggested like maybe there are some other probabilities that we are missing in the analysis. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I also agree. Right, you can improve the analysis techniques, but essentially it is. Uh, at its heart, you don't have a close form solution by design, very likely, um, for, for sampling probability. So, you know, just uh, you know, analysis or not just analysis, but also like tinkering with the form of the algorithm uh, that still has some limitations, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree that's well, basically, well, a simpler analysis means that it's easier to build on network and also easier to like improve the other time in certain ways. But having it's, just a complex analysis, so I need to side with cow in this case, like that's a good reason to, to look more mm -hmm. and try to simplify that analysis because then yeah, you don't want to 
close down a path just because the current analysis is is not nice. Oh, true, true. Yeah, absolutely right? true. Absolutely true. Yeah. All right. So I this will be four because I guess like after all this discussion, we really need to take a look at this analysis. But uh, I guess before we do that, maybe can I have like one like really high level question regarding yeah. this uh, this whole algorithm design? So this distribution that you have over the actions. So can that be written as some sort of like an, a distribution that is induced by some kind of like FTRL or some kind of like regularization scheme, some kind of like, I don't know, like a maximum entropy style policy? It's obviously not that, but I'm just wondering if you have yeah, some yeah. sort of information on that from. Right. You know. Yeah. At, at some point, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point I did consider like, uh, you know, connection with like this uh, dumbbell trick, uh, but it didn't lead to any interesting interpretation. Um, but of course, from the form of the algorithm, you know, you can write it down using the dumbbell trick. Okay. I guess maybe the relation to DAC is is what's uh, maybe a little bit more relevant here that maybe you, you can imagine that this is just solving a similar optimization problem that you are looking for a sampling distribution that is optimal in a certain sense. And there you expect to see, I don't know, various terms, regularization terms, whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that was pretty much my question as well. When, I, when I'm asking about FTRL, can we, I guess what I mean is whether you can write this as the maximizer of some expected loss, right? right, right, right. Plus some convex regularization on the policy. Right. This doesn't look obvious to me. Yeah, it would be very interesting to uh, investigate. Yeah. Okay, and, and I guess my second question, which is gonna lead us further down towards these questions on the analysis. So, right. Is there some kind of like an optimistic interpretation of what this algorithm is doing, or yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind of like optimism argument in the analysis? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, in, in, you know, very at a very high level, the algorithm design it was designed in a way that it'll uh, prefer, it'll prefer, okay, I was trying to show you the algorithm, but I don't see the algorithm here. Okay. But, but it was designed so that, you know, you are assigning larger probability for those that have smaller gaps. So I think that already encodes the idea of optimism. Right, so Thompson sampling, it can be understood as sort of a randomized uh, optimism, right? You're assigning larger probability with whatever that has a, a high uncertainty plus the center or empirical mean. And I think that's roughly being coded. In terms of the analysis, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, it's not clear to me what would be qualified as an optimistic analysis or any sort. Um, but, but so here's uh, one thing that I wanted to show. Uh, there are mainly like three cases in the analysis. Uh, F1, F2, F3, and the, each one corresponds to different situation. F1 is the usual case. That's what you expect to happen. F2 and F3 is, uh, F2 is like arm I empirical mean behaves weirdly and badly. So that's uh, one unusual event. Another unusual event is empirical best arm behaves badly. But this F1, you look at the analysis, then you skip, skip, skip. It, at the end of the day, you introduce this free parameter U. So this is a standard in UCB analysis. Uh, you introduce uh, uh, value U, and the expected arm pole for arm uh, uh, I becomes uh, something like this, where you can you know, freely tune this U. And U is um, optimized at one over delta I squared times log T times delta I squared. And somehow this scheme just assigns the optimal ratio 
uh, optimal sort of uh, arm pole. It's the expected arm pole that's assigned by this algorithm is, uh, it, it, it coincides with the optimal quantity somehow. But I don't know if that's uh, related to your question. Okay, so, so can you just show me the definition of these events again? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. So, so yeah, so so, this is um, <clears throat> empirical best mean is mm -hmm. behaving uh, sufficiently good. It's not mm -hmm. too much mm -hmm. underestimated, it's just around. Right. So you can imagine this, I think this is better. Just look at the F1 yeah. case, like the empirical mean is fine and empirical gap is sufficiently large. Okay? It's not like mm -hmm. underestimated. So that means because the empirical best mean was behaving well, uh, it implies that empirical mean of arm I was also behaving well. It's not mm -hmm. too overestimated. It's a typical event, but what you can do is like, essentially the algorithm has this exponent, right? X minus two mm -hmm. times arm pole times the count, but you have the condition that arm pole is sufficient and the empirical gap is sufficient. It's sufficiently uh, large. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can bound that quantity here uh, in the probability this number of arm poles and the gap uh, by these quantities in the condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how it arises. Right, I see. So it's, it's just that uh, somehow in terms of sampling, or the frequentist analysis of some sampling, the hard part in the proof always seems to be showing that you actually do play the optimal arm enough times, right? That, uh -huh. uh, I see. Uh, because, you know, with, with UCV, you're always optimistic. So as long as your confidence intervals hold, you're mm -hmm. basically never going to drop the optimal arm. But, but right. in terms of sampling, this may somehow still weirdly happen. Mm -hmm. I see. Out, and that is the most, pain, most uh -huh. painstaking part. I see. At least that's my interpretation of these uh, oh. of these analysis. Right, yeah. And do you do you actually have to do something like that here? Uh, yeah. So actually, my impression is uh, the some other uh, interpretation. So my uh, impression was that the precisely where you get this large constant, like lemma two point thirteen, that's the case for. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. For this F3, F3 where the empirical best arm is underestimated. Okay, so this is mm -hmm. a case yeah. where you're in mayhem, like you're using empirical best arm's value to compute the empirical gap, mm -hmm. but it's all now screwed because this is not behaving well. So, so F3 is uh, the, actually the hardest part of the proof in this uh, algorithm. And so, but basically, uh, uh, just to explain a bit, so mm -hmm. it, it's kind of this situation. So mu i, right, the arm i's empirical mean is behaving as expected, but it has a much smaller gap or even gap zero uh, because the empirical best arm is largely underestimated. Okay. So, so in this case, you know, it, it's, it's the case where you have to, uh, get the control from the behavior of the true best arm. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the intuition is that like, well, if this kind of thing happens, arm one still have large enough probability to be sampled. So that, you know, by the law of large number, uh -huh. it gets sampled and then it'll get back up. And if the new one get back up, then the empirical best mean also gets back up because that's an upper bound to mm -hmm. the empirical means. But, but eventually what it becomes is that, oh, well, okay, one thing I mentioned is like this relating, there's a step of relating probability of pulling on I with pulling on one. And that's uh, pretty much the idea taken from Thompson's sampling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, yeah, anyone look at the Thompson sampling proof will notice this kind of a probability ratio uh, argument. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, this is still like the thing that appears in Thompson's Henry paper where you can kind of partition the time step. So this number step two, time partitioning mm -hmm. argument, um, but eventually it becomes an interval that you need to evaluate. That's the thing at the bottom. Um, 
-hmm. So there's a, you know, this fight between this exponential term that increases with this index K, exponentially increases, but then this indicator is about deviation. So this X bar K is basically deviation or, of the best arm around the mean. Mm -hmm. This is a noisy, noise part. And the noise, if K increases, that noise gets reduced and reduced and reduced. So this probability, this, this indicator at the bottom, that probability becomes exponentially small with K. So there's this uh, thing that are sort of uh, fighting each other, mm -hmm. uh, but you have to crank up the mathematics to figure out, you know, what's the, the how does that evaluate? So this is uh, where intuition is running out. You just use peeling and crank up the math and see what it tells us. Mm -hmm. um, um, but but I would say I, yeah that that's the the hardest part in this analysis, and this I is exactly that. right the Thompson samplings proof on this kind of event that's where they get a lot of uh, large uh, constant factors and so on, and it becomes uh, lengthy. Um, yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah, I right, remember that. Yeah. So um, but but there's a, a, a actually a, a, a shortcut that uh, Chicheng Zhang that I'm working with. Uh, he came up with a shorter proof, so uh, it'll be a little easier. Then. Mm. Nice. Okay. Curious to read that. So maybe Chaba, you can stop the recording uh, because uh, no, I guess we are getting like really technical here, and maybe.